Welcome to the Edgeworth Echoes podcast, Discovering Edgeworth's Town, a hidden gem of Irish history. Welcome to the second episode of our podcast entitled Acting, Science and Journalism. This is your host, John. While Edgeworth Town has an obvious connection to the Edgeworth family, there are other noteworthy historical figures that have connections to the town that are worth hearing about. In this episode, I am taking a look at some of those people and why we remember them. It was in the year of 1866, and on a very beautiful day, that eighty-two passengers, with spirits light and gay, left Gravesend Harbour and sailed gaily away on board the steamship London. Amongst the passengers was Gustavus V. Brooke, who was to be seen walking on the poop, also clergymen and bankers and magistrates also, all chatting merrily together in the cabin below. The steamship SS London left Plymouth on the 6th of January headed for Melbourne, but was caught in a bad storm in the Bay of Biscay on the 10th of January 1866. The ship passed through the storm, but damaged by the heavy seas, the captain decided to turn the ship around and head back to Plymouth, and got caught in the storm once again, and on the 12th of January it sank. Only 19 people survived. Among the notable passengers who died on that day were John Debenham, son of William Debenham, founder of the Debenham and Freebodies department stores, also James and Elizabeth Bevan, parents of the first Wales rugby union captain, James Bevan, and finally the man mentioned in the audio you just heard, Gustavus V. Brook, an Irish actor. The V stands for Vaughan. The audio you listened to was a couple of extracts from the poem The Wreck of the Steamer London, while on her way to Australia. It is a poem by Scottish poet William McGonagall, who frequently wrote poems about disasters. Gustavus was born in Dublin in 1818, and came to Edgerton to study in the school founded by Lovell Edward, son of Richard Lovell and brother of Mariah. I went to that celebrated academy in the year 1826, and remained there for two years. At that time, there were upwards of 500 boys composed of boarders, outboarders, and day scholars. Gustavus goes on to tell us more about the school. The boarders occupied a large house adjoining the school and paid a considerable sum for the privileges. Master Brooke, however, owing to his youth and other circumstances, paid much less than any other boy in the house. The outboarders were quartered through the town and were looked after by the various ladies who accommodated them and who were responsible to, mis- responsible to Mr. Edgeworth for their conduct and behaviour. The three classes of boys were dressed in nice well-made blouses, ornamented according to the taste of their respective mothers or guardians, and were inspected every morning on entering the schoolroom by Lovell Edgeworth himself. That gentleman lived outside the town in a beautiful large house, well wooded, with many ornamental walks and shrubberies. Gustavus then went to Dublin, to a school run by the Reverend William Jones. There he showed talent in a school play, and after seeing William Charles MacReady perform in Dublin in March 1832, Gustavus was determined to go on the stage. His debut was was as William Tell at 15. Over the coming years his reputation grew thanks to performances in Dublin, Belfast and London. He got married in 1851 to Margaret Bray and went to America with great success. But it wasn't all good. His financial affairs were in disarray, he was warned he might lose his voice and he started to drink heavily. A six year term in Australia seemed set to put him back on top of his profession. He excelled in tragedies, comedies and Irish roles, being hailed as one of the greatest actors of the time. However, his financial worries came back to haunt him and his return to Britain was unsuccessful and he lost almost all his money and he continued to drink heavily. His second wife, Avonia Jones, herself an actress, got him signed up for another tour of Australia and it was for that reason he was on the SS London where he died at sea. Witnesses reported that Brooke behaved courageously during the shipwreck, working manfully at the pumps 
in an effort to save the ship. Our next subject is George Edward Dobson, zoologist, who was born on the 4th of September 1848 in Edgerstown. He was the eldest son of Park Dobson, a doctor in Edgerstown and who originally came from County Westmeath. George was educated at the Royal School of Enniskillen and at Trinity College Dublin. He was the first senior moderator and first gold medalist in experimental and natural science and in 1868 he joined the army as a medical officer. He retired from the army in 1888 due to bad health with the rank of Surgeon Major. Dobson will be chiefly remembered for his investigation over a period of 20 years into the structure and classification of two groups of mammals, the Chiroptera, which are bats, and Insectivora, on both of which he became the chief authority of his time. While stationed in India between 1868 and 1875, he carried out a major study into the bats of that country, and his work on bats became the standard guide to the mammals for many years. On his return to Britain, he was hired by the British Museum to catalogue their collections. He also wrote Medical Hints to Travellers, published by the Royal Geographical Society, and contributed to the Encyclopaedia Britannica. George Dobson died in 1875 in Kent, where he is buried. Imagine a scene in Paris in 1871, a city that has been under siege by the Prussian army, a city that now finds itself, not for the first time, the centre of a revolution. The people of the city started their own government called the Commune, aimed at providing free education for children, separation of church and state, as well as workers' rights. The French government were not too happy about the Commune and eventually overthrew the Commune following a violent conflict known as the Bloody Week. This seems a world away from a small Irish town, but the connection is there in the form of Andrew Johnson, who was a landowner in Kerboy, Edgerstown, who had a wife Grace, an American, and a daughter Emily, born in 1841. Following the death of Andrew in 1857, Grace took Emily and her sister to Paris. While there, Emily attended the Sorbonne and she climbed up the Eiffel Tower, which was still under construction at the time. A letter to a friend was seen by a magazine editor and she got asked to write for the London Morning Star. She married George Morland Crawford in 1864. George was also a journalist, writing for the Daily News, and the two collaborated in sending dispatches to London papers, notably during the Franco-German War of 1870-71. During the uprising in Paris described earlier, she made her way through the streets at night to meet with the leaders of the Commune. In May 1871, she was granted unique access to a debate at Versailles, in which the French government was defeated. Lacking writing material, she memorised the proceedings and met her husband in a cafe at midnight. The two worked all night and their report reached the Daily News a full day before any rivals. During the overthrow of the Commune, she and her husband had to flee Paris by train. Emily and George continued their work as journalists together right up until his death in 1885. After he died, she took up his position with the Daily News until 1907. She passed away in 1915 in Bristol. Thanks for listening to this episode and I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to follow us to hear more of the history of our town and please share with friends. Until next time. If you are interested in learning more about the society and the history they preserve, please visit www.mariahedwardcentre.com. You can sign up to our newsletter, book tours, learn about our annual literary festival and read up on some of the remarkable people who have links to our town. This has been the Edgeworth Echoes podcast, Rediscovering History. <laughs>